Ćao društvo, dobrodošli na još jedan tutorial Slobode Amazone Balkan, tačnije još jedno gostovanje. Ovom prilikom imamo za gosta Krisa Megeba koji je inače bivši radnik Amazon Seller Performance tima, tačnije onog dijela sellera koji su koji imaju registrovan svoj brand, to je već neka druga vrsta podrške odnosno na onu klasičnu podršku koju imaju obični Amazon selleri koji nemaju registrovan brand. Ovom prilikom Chris će nas uputiti na neke bitne stavke vezane kako to da preventivno sebe sačuvamo i svoj brand od potencijalne Amazon suspenzije. Pa ajde da krenemo. So Chris, welcome. Nice to have you on my channel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, we already discussed on Facebook about the questions from our audience, but you already know that there is a lot of people from Serbia who are totally beginners in this business. Yeah. So my goal having you on this channel is to help us to prevent the problem. So if mm -hmm. you have... Uh, like examples that the, the cases you had and uh, with your agency what did you do in the last period yeah so what yeah help us long but we spoke about the trademarks on the beginning so it's like uh, i suggest all the time people to to be aware to have a trademark uh, before uh, even jump right. in the amazon business so let's Let's start with rights owner protection. We're talking about private label brands. Um, I'm sure in in Serbia, but in el elsewhere in Europe, we, we've talked to, I don't know, hundreds if not thousands of small brands that are slowly building on Amazon UK, Amazon EU, and here in USA. Um, and rights owner protections are really important. I don't recommend that anyone sell anything if, if you can help it, don't sell the product at all unless you're trademark registered first because you cannot get brand registered within Amazon system without having the trademark. And I understand it can take, it depends on whether it's Europe or US, it can take months to get a trademark. But it, it's still something to consider uh, waiting to sell. Because if you sell right away and it's not a branded product, you will have a lot of other sellers jumping on the listing saying, this is a generic product. I'm selling a generic product. I belong on this listing too. And you don't want anyone who's not selling your branded item to say that, right? Yeah. The only way to enforce rights ownership or to protect your brand really in today's Amazon is to have the trademark registered, to have therefore the brand registered within Amazon's tools and systems and then you can use brand registry to try to resolve problems with people who jump on your listings who are selling a different product than what your brand is or who are violating your intellectual property only through trademark registration i mean of course you can use an ip attorney for some of this but some of it you can handle on your own if you understand how it works how to, how to do it yeah. i saw some cases that people start to sell some products without a trademark and yep. some let's say hijackers yeah they trademark yeah. this that product yeah with the same name and jump to claim that it's they are the owners so they 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 trying to exactly. steal the business so this is a exactly and then you've wasted all that time all that money all that inventory everything um for something that you could have fixed by simply registering the trademark before you sold those products if it's if it's not trademark registered, if it's not brand registered, then it's going to be an unbranded item, which is a generic item. And those other sellers do belong on that listing for what should be just your product, because it is at that point generic. And you can't brand something later. You can't suddenly add your trademark later and then kick all these people off the listing. That's considered page tampering, detail right. page tampering. Right. Um, if it was created as a generic listing and sold as a generic listing, then you are isolating and alienating all these other sellers later, trying to kick them off a listing when you suddenly brand it. And it just creates a huge mess. Sometimes you can actually sort this out later and you don't have to create an entirely new listing, but it can take a lot of time. And then the, the, the other sellers are submitting infringement claims against you. You're submitting them against them. It's a whole mess that you don't want to waste your time on. Um, you'll spend all your time dealing with notice infringement teams at Amazon instead of launching a product and growing the revenue and focusing on getting good product reviews 
all the things you need to do when you're new and you're trying to grow. Because if you don't grow right, if you stall or stagnate, somebody else will sell a similar product and they'll grow faster. And then you've wasted a lot of time and effort. Yeah. Even even the support in brand registry is different than from usual. Yeah. Yeah. So it's much... Uh, yeah. Right. Brand registry support used to be better than it is now, but they're not as bad as seller support or they're not as yeah. bad as... Sure. Um, you know, the teams that work on the verification cases, the stuck registration, those ones, those are very low level teams, right? Um, and so is seller support. Brand registry is better than that, but brand registry is also tough to escalate within. About a year ago, we were escalating a lot of brand registry cases and getting things fixed and successful that way. Um, now they have so many cases, they have so many escalations, they have so many appeals of listing abuse or trademark disputes, anything, authenticity disputes, they're overwhelmed, right? Just like my former teams, the seller performance teams. Yeah, they, what I see also for some of my friends, you know, when they start to sell, they don't even think about authenticity and the uh, hazard yeah. policy for Amazon. This is more important, yeah? Because I heard right. around, it's true that some of the authority from, from Texas are hunting mm -hmm. the sellers trying to catch, do they have a label of Prop 65? You know? mm -hmm. So if, if the product contains the, the, the ingredients yeah. of the, yeah, who are, uh, there's, okay. yeah. There's a lot of preparation that goes into selling. I think the biggest problem, and, and again, the, the sellers who get stuck in registration who never even sell have this problem too. They're trying to do it prematurely. They're not ready yet. They're, they're doing it too early and they don't have the documents in place or they haven't studied the policy pages or they don't understand what Amazon needs to verify your identity, verify uh, the account, the registration. It's the same thing with people who are selling. I know you wanted to talk a little bit about drop shipping. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, pe people who are selling without invoices, um, you know, any day their account could be suspended for inauthentic and they could be asked for invoices. If they don't have the invoices for items that have not sold, then their account will be suspended until they can appeal it and successfully appeal it. As you told so, me, Amazon is starting to, to suspend dropshippers. Yeah. They, well, not just starting. They've been doing it for months, but they're not making it easy to get back on unless you say, we won't drop ship. We will only sell items that we have invoices for. So that's kind of a very clear distinction that they've made. Obviously, anyone violating the drop shipping policy can be suspended just for violating how you drop ship. Drop shipping isn't against policy, but if Amazon questions authenticity of your products, you need to have great supply chain information to show them. Authenticity letters, invoices. Um, yeah, I recommend people have a letter from their supplier on their company letterhead that, that describes where they get the products. Um, because Amazon doesn't want to take chances that anything's counterfeit at this point. Yeah, I saw also the example that uh, my friend uh, right appealed and also they needed to send the invoice from the factory, but the factory no. didn't have a clear website. So they, they didn't get no. approval from the Amazon. It's, it's not verified like they didn't trust the supplier. Exactly. Exactly. They call it an unverified supplier, which is extremely common right now. Um, I mean, we're, we're recording this in late uh, February. Um, the last month or two and then heading into March, uh, we hear about this every day. Unverified supplier. You, you could be private label. You could be a reseller. It doesn't matter. They need excellent information on where you got the product, who made the product, websites, contact. It's not just links to a website, but you need to have a website. They want the name of the contact person and they want to be able to make a phone call, talk to that person, hopefully talk to them directly, give them a direct dial number if you can, instead of just giving like a, you know, general phone number, um, give their email address, do as much, as you can, hopefully it's somebody who might even be on the website for the supplier. That would be great too. Yeah, there, there is uh, one more example I know. It's uh, the uh, invoice address from the factory didn't yeah. match with the shipping plan. Right. You know, and they didn't uh, approve the, the appeal. I know. Addresses, 
So there's two different address problems. Your address has to match. Whatever you have in Seller Central has to be on the invoice for you as the buyer. And then the in, the address on the invoice for the supplier needs to match what an Amazon investigator will search, maybe on Google or just search online, what they find for the website. So if they find your supplier uh, URL, they go to their website and they look up their address, they want to see that same address on the invoice for the supplier. So I know some of this sounds really you know nitpicky and really strict, but part of the reason is because sellers were faking invoices. That's where this comes from. Photoshop all the time. Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah, I saw. I so, saw one of the uh, suppliers uh, wrote uh, the address because they ship from other address. And yeah. when my friend asked them why you do, why you didn't report to me the uh, that ad- address from the invoice didn't match with the shipping plan, you know, to prepare yeah. to them, they said like uh, we. Uh, from previous buyers, they they asked us like to give them some other address because they sell the same product from the same but yeah. on other brands. Yeah. So I and every I, detail has to. Yeah, <laughs> I, I report yeah. I, that was from my friend. We spoke together with the, with the supplier, and I told them if you continue to do this, you will be on a blacklist from the Amazon. Yeah, as a supplier. Yeah. So you are. They question. They question everything. Be able to answer any question. Be able to defend anything on an invoice, and if necessary, I have some clients who get a letter. Amazon has un- uh, refused the invoice. They thought it was fabricated or edited or photoshopped, or they couldn't verify the supplier. So every time we send an invoice, we try to send an authenticity letter from the supplier. It's, it talks about how long you've been in business with them. Um, hopefully, it talks about how long they've been an established wholesaler or distributor for the items you're selling from them. If you're reselling, if you're private label and you've got a you know a factory or a manufacturer, um, something that shows where your brand is made, they have to have a website. You can't just say, "Well, they don't have a website." That that that'll result in a denial. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I always say to people that you need to be an expert in your product also. Yeah, you yeah. need to be prepared before even thinking about the bank register. You need to test the to send the product in the in the laboratory to test to have reports. Right. You know, because usually uh, the supplier they are lazy, they don't want to pay for extra laboratory tests. And they say to you, yeah. you can you can have this one, but they don't want that you need to have it on your name, on your brand name. Because if Amazon mm-hmm. asks you, you need to have everything prepared because you do. Pl- pl- you have to. You <laughs> have to have all that. And also, I recommend that people, even after they've been selling an item for a bit and after they've been manufacturing it for a while, um, don't just start sending everything into FBA. Still get samples sent to you yeah. out of every batch or every other batch, but open those boxes, inspect the products, make sure the quality is still what it was earlier. In yeah. um, every every shipment because if you start getting item quality or condition complaints, those can pile up extremely quickly. Um, and I don't know if new sellers who haven't experienced this firsthand know that before they start, uh, because we hear from new sellers all the time who two months in, all of a sudden they have four authenticity complaints or three condition complaints. And they may not even understand how close they are to being suspended because they've only just started. But Amazon isn't the place to experiment or learn later or read policy pages in the future. Do it all before you start. Yeah. They, they Otherwise, need prepare, yeah. they need to you, learn. I mean, you have you have to be prepared to to put a product in a buyer's hands anyway. If you're manufacturing something. Or if you're sourcing something from a another supplier, you have to know the item's quality before you sell it to anyone, whether it's an Amazon buyer or somebody else. But consider that Amazon is an extremely unforgiving place. And if they think you're making mistakes, they don't care if you're new. They don't care if it's different from what you did before. They don't really care what the reasons are. They just want you to show to them that you fix the problem immediately. Yeah, I always say to them that you need First, to know how to 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 find the the quality of the supplier. The second, yeah. when you when you order your products, first do a, a inspection of material. Mm-hmm. Then you do uh, a inspection during the the production of the manufacturing of the, of the product, and then yeah. at, the, at the end do pre shipment inspection. Right. 
with this you are covered and also prepare all the invoices original not pro uh, pro forma invoices original not pro invoices. forma yeah so you nothing yeah the pro forma ones drive me crazy because that's so easy to avoid but people are still sending invoices that's stamped right on their pro forma immediately rejected yeah yeah so this is with this you are covered from the beginning and then you can uh, yeah, the rest is like uh, maybe listing compliance. <laughs> that is the next yeah. one. When you start to create the listing, you need to know what you need to write, what you cannot. Write. Right. And even right. If, uh, I see that some examples like people use it in uh, in the title maybe Bluetooth, the world of Wi-Fi. Yep. So they yep. get rejected. They get. Uh, yeah. It's a good way to attract. Um, and Amazon's very sensitive to keyword abuse now. Trademarked keywords not just in titles, anywhere in the detail page, um, anywhere on an image too. So because Amazon's looking for every way to reduce the chances that a brand will submit an IP infringement to them against you. Every time, every time that happens, Amazon's dragged into it, kicking and screaming and they're involved and they don't want to be involved. If there's a problem between you and some other brand or some other rights owner, they want, you to go somewhere and handle it yourselves. They don't want to be involved because they're just a marketplace, right? They don't officiate legal disputes. Yeah. Um, they have to take action on a, on an infringement complaint, a rights ownership complaint. They can't refuse to respond to that. They have to take the listing down and send the warning. But in terms of who's right and who's wrong, that's not up to them unless you can, successfully prove that it's a false fake baseless infringement complaint in any other case it's between you and the rights owner and the contact information amazon gives you no of course also it's um, some people write like a hundred percent money back guarantee on the on the, in the in i know the <laughs> they call that pdp tampering so that's that's what they call seller adding seller specific information anything unique to you that will taint or contaminate that listing so that somebody else can't list on that product on that same listing. So money back guarantee, um, you know, free two day shipping, uh, free gift, anything like that um, has to come out because somebody else needs to be able to list on that list, that product on that listing, unless it's gated, which most brands are not gated on Amazon. And, and that will stay the, the, the the gating rules will stay as they are now for a long time. They're not going to allow every private label brand to gate their product. Yeah. So you can't have exclusive to you content in a listing like, like money back guarantee. I still see that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and, but now, now they're suspending accounts. They're not just taking the listings down. Now they're suspending accounts for that. But it's, uh, yeah. Now it's more strict than before. Before you get a yeah. warning. And then now immediately you get suspended and then you need to appeal. I know. It's, and you have also, I say to people, you you cannot, there is a steps you need to follow before, you know, even you open a case, like a basic mm. step, then you need to take care. If you don't get approval, you mm -hmm. need to, to write correct appeal. Or if you are not sure, you need to, to have someone like you. Well, I, I, right now, I tell people, if you've done it before, if you're brand new, then you haven't done it before and you need advice, at least a little bit of advice anyway. Um, but this is a very specific appeals process. This is not an appeal that you would write to submit a court action in Serbia or a court in the United States. It's not like that. It's Amazon unique, Amazon specific. And they, they have certain criteria and if you don't have some of that content, they throw it away. They don't really even read it, let alone answer you. If they do answer you, they might not give you any usable information on how you can fix it. So it's important to understand that the basic information, I know they give you resources. I know they give you some very basic steps, but that's not everything. I mean, that's the beginning point. You can't take the seller help pages and follow it word for word and say, all I have to do is follow these steps that they gave me and I'll be fine. It takes more sophistication than that. You have to write things in a brief, concise way. You can't write pages and pages. They never will read that. Um, and you have to present to them solutions. You have to show them. I mean, the short version is you have, yeah, 
you have to pick out the root causes. You have to show that you identify that you diagnosed exactly what you did wrong, not just in general terms, but in specifics. And then proactive solutions. I put these measures into place. They will work. They will be effective. You prove that. You can really just write one or two sentences per line that show and that prove that you understand exactly how you made some mistakes, exactly how you sold the wrong products, whatever the problem was. But you've already put into place and completed actions that will remove the likelihood that that happens again. You're preventing... The future prevention piece is the most important, I think, because they have to be, they have to believe that you've fixed it to the extent that it won't come up again. Yeah, but is there any chance that even after they say that they will not reply anymore, is there any chance that they will still uh, take in consideration your uh, appeal and check it again? Yeah. We get replies for people all the time who uh, got the message saying we may not reply because it does not say we will not reply. It says we may not reply to f- f- uh, further messages. Sometimes they mean it. Sometimes they don't. So the only way, and you can't tell by reading it just on your seller central, sen- seller central screen. So the only way to really know is by appealing more. But if you keep sending them the same kinds of appeals that you sent them in the past, then of course they're going to stop responding. Um, it's, it's your warning. It's your indication that things have to change. You need a better appeal. And if you've written a great appeal and they're just not listening, they're not reviewing it, then you need to escalate it and say, no, you keep saying I haven't given you the right information. And I have, and here it is. I sent it to the team that suspended me and they're not listening. They're not responding anymore. We need another team to look at it. We need a manager to look at it, a higher level manager to look at it. There are ways of getting responses because as you can see, I'm sure your sellers have seen, they overuse the message that says we may not respond anymore. They send it all the time. When I was working there, we sent it only when we meant we will never respond again because we've responded nine times in a row and you're still sending me the same thing. That's the way it's supposed to be used. I had that that, uh, experience, but... It was only three times I spoke with them. The third time when I sent the email, it's uh, my my supplier was on vacation or something like that. And I wrote them, answer, I, I will write back as soon as possible mm-hmm. when I get all information from my supplier. The next mail from Amazon was, we will not uh, answer anymore because you don't provide us uh, all information. So right. they, you know, and after when I appeal, nothing happened. Yeah, sometimes you're giving them what they ask for and they say, we may not respond. And sometimes you're not giving what they need, whether it's an invoice or a good POA plan of action. And they say, we may not respond and they mean it because they can tell after three or four tries that you don't have what they need to reinstate you. Um, I usually work with sellers and clients who I know they've got the documentation. I know they've got a decent plan of action. Some people write a good plan of action and Amazon's not taking any time to review it and they bring me in for the escalation steps to get them to review it, to pressure them a little bit because a lot of times nowadays, especially uh, without that pressure, they forget about you. And if you're waiting to hear back from them, you can just, you might wait forever. You can wait two or three weeks for them to answer. They might answer, but how do you even know that answer will be positive? So. So that is, so that means that even Amazon can make mistake. Amazon makes a lot of mistakes, yeah, and but they're not necessarily willing to correct them unless you push them a little bit. But but you have to make sure if you're pushing them that everything is 100% solid on your side because it's a big marketplace. Uh, globally, there are millions of sellers. There's only so many Amazon account investigators, whether it's in Seattle or India or anywhere. There's only so many of them in, in terms of headcount. And it's a difficult marketplace to regulate or to police. They've got so much going on to keep an eye on. So you have to correspond with them the right way. Keep it short. Make sure your best writer is writing the content. Make sure you're not just guessing at things. Because if if they think you're kind of an amateur and you don't really know e-commerce or you don't know how the marketplace on Amazon works, for them, that's an excuse to say, we don't even want this seller. Like They're not acting like somebody we would even want to keep. So 
you know, it has to be as professional as possible, even when Amazon is not acting so professional themselves, which happens, unfortunately. Of course. So uh, let's speak more about um, attacks of hijackers. How to, yeah. how to, yes, how to know which one is attacked from the hijackers, how to... Uh, right. Because of so, the, you know, so many people w- 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 was attacked with reviews, negative reviews, and uh, right. uh, how we can... Well, reviews... Them. Reviews are tough because, well, first of all, Amazon doesn't have a good process around identifying what's a fake review from a real review. And that's going to take months, if not more, to sort out. But reviews, if you're making an allegation, we're hit with fake reviews, make sure you have some evidence. Make sure you have some indication that something you know, shady or deceptive is going on because you need to know, I mean, you might just have negative reviews. If your product is not as good as you think it is, you might have real buyers leaving bad reviews. You have to consider that. Um, The same as negative feedback. Every time you get a negative feedback, you can't say, this is obviously from a competitor. Because that's what every seller says to Amazon (laughs) every time. You have to have that. I mean, that's the first step is the honest conversation with yourself. Is there a chance that this is really somebody who didn't understand my product, didn't like my product, didn't have a good experience with me. Um, I mean, there could be some real fa- uh, real negative reviews in there. They're not necessarily fake just because they're negative. So I have to say that first, because I know a lot of sellers complain to Amazon about fake reviews, but they had no evidence and Amazon refused to do anything about it. Right. Um, it's okay totally yeah. to have at least few negative reviews. You look yeah. so natural. You know I mean, uh, I know <laughs> it's real. It's more genuine that way. Exactly. Um, and don't ask people to change their reviews. Don't say we'll give you a new product. We'll help you in some other way. We'll give you a refund, but change your review. It's really hurting us. Don't say any of these things. Okay. That's considered review manipulation. Don't ask people to change negative feedback. If you want to give somebody a, a free or discounted version of a new of another product, then just do it. Don't ask for anything in return. If they want to change their review or their feedback, they will do it. They shouldn't need a request from you to do it. Exactly. For me, it's yeah. more, more important that, that customer service, even when they message me, I, right. I send them at least maybe one uh, free product, but mm-hmm. they see that um, I really care about, about the customer and they are really leaving the, the feedback for the seller, even for the correcting the, the, yeah. the review. Yeah. yeah. Now, hijackers is another term we have to define because unfortunately in the forums and on Facebook and seller conversations I have, people are using weird definitions for, for hijack. A hijack listing is somebody, I have a branded product. I'm brand registered, trademark registered. Somebody's used the catalog teams or... Um, loopholes in catalog to abuse my listing by uh, taking the images down or changing the images, changing the detail page content. That's what a high, a listing hijacker is. They've taken over your listing and your private label brands. Um, Or as a reseller, you know, changes that the manufacturer website would not support are made to the listing. Is it correct? So is it correct that it is good to upload the listing through the, uh, to the file? So through the file? Yeah. Flat files. Flat files. Flat files. Um, a lot of people are using the term hijacking in, a, in the wrong way, which is I have a branded product and somebody is on my listing saying they sell it now. That's not a hijacker. Mm-hmm. That's somebody who's a reseller. They might not be what you consider authorized, but you have to do a test buy and check out the product for uh, any signs of counterfeit, which would be a different product than your product before you accuse them of counterfeit and before you submit um, reports of abuse to Amazon or counterfeit reports to the notice infringement teams. Yeah. So a lot of sellers don't understand. They think, oh, I've got a hijacker. I need to report them. I need to get them off my listing. They're not authorized. M- most, if not at this point, all brand, uh, branded listings are not gated. So if, so if your listing is not gated, it means that somebody else can at least in theory say that they're selling your product. And if they bought your product and it's not counterfeit, you can't accuse them of counterfeit. If they bought it through other distribution channels, then the real issue is what, what is your control over your distribution of the product? Because for example, if I have a hot selling brand, 
And I get a call from Walmart and Walmart says, we want to buy your product or we want to sell your products on walmart.com. Maybe my products are sold in a Walmart store. And then somebody comes along who's an Amazon reseller. They buy it at a discount. There's a sale, 30% off. They buy it for $70 and they want to sell it for $100 on Amazon. That's not a counterfeit product. That's a genuine product that I sold to Walmart. It, it went through Walmart's supply chain to get in the hands of that reseller. And then they pop up on my listing. It's the same exact product. They're selling it because they bought it through one of my distribution channels. You can't have it both ways. I can't turn around and say, oh, that's a hijacker. I want to kick them off my Amazon listing. And I don't know who this seller is, so I'm reporting them for counterfeit. Um, you can't falsely accuse people of selling counterfeit goods when they haven't done it. They can um, initiate litigation or even if you're threatening to sue them, they can counter sue you for defaming them and defamation that they're selling counterfeit. They bought it at a retail store and there's nothing that Amazon says in their terms of service or their agreement that says we will enforce your distribution for you or we will enforce exclusivity for you. Amazon will not say that unless they have a clause in their contract with Nike or some major brand that says, we will let you decide who sells our, your products on Amazon. But even that's like, um, you know, something that you can't do at least in the United States in terms of unfair trade. And yeah. um, that's considered collusion. There's nothing you can really do to stop that person from selling your product unless you stop selling it to Walmart in the first place. So we cannot fight with them. Yeah, we cannot contact them and fight. That's why we, we can jump on this code of conduct and to speak more about it. Right. I mean, well, no, you can. I mean, you buy the product. You do a test buy. Maybe it's a fake product. You can report a counterfeit item, but you can't assume that it's counterfeit. You can't say, I have a hijacker, which, first of all, that's not a hijacker. That's just a reseller of the product. But unless you have the test buy and take photos of the packaging and you do the written description, everything Amazon asks for, you can't accuse them of counterfeit. You can't just knock somebody off a list off your listing because you don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> but so. Amazon have this also policy for how you communicate with other sellers. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, and the other thing people do is they get their lawyer to send a cease and desist. You can't, you have no right to sell our product on Amazon. Here's a cease and desist. They try to scare people with those types of legal tactics. But if you're going to use the cease and desist path, make sure you've hired the right lawyer. Make sure you don't hire a lawyer who has no idea how it works on Amazon, no idea what they're doing in terms of explaining to you, this can come back to bite you. If you do a cease and desist, somebody can fight you back on this because you're essentially threatening to sue them and you have no basis for suing them or you're threatening litigation or legal action, but you're just trying to scare them with a cease and desist. You don't really have a basis to enforce it. And attorneys that are really trying to get money from clients aren't going to necessarily explain that you shouldn't be doing what you're hiring them to do. So that can be, I'm glad you mentioned code of conduct because that has often been considered grounds for a code of conduct suspension. If Amazon thinks you're submitting false infringement claims against other sellers, then they can suspend you for your behavior attacking other sellers. And that's considered code of conduct. Yeah, this is, this yeah. is what, what people don't know. You know? They, they think they right. can speak how they want with other people Yeah, on the, on the chat. Right. Well, uh, Chris, is there something else you want to, uh, to share with us? For me, you give, the, give us a lot of information. Right. Just uh, do, do the most. I mean, I'm just thinking still in terms of new sellers. Of course. And, and of course, product compliance, product safety, you know, testing products, sampling products, having a batch that's going to FBA, having it sent to you first for inspection. All of these are basics and Amazon expects you to do those. But even if you're new, think about the types of complaints you might get from buyers and try to anticipate those, whether it's packaging changes you do or how even just item condition complaints, how well are the items secured inside the packaging? You know, don't underinvest in the packaging because you don't want, as a new seller, you don't want a series of damaged in transit or def item defective complaints because Amazon will think that you underinvested in the packaging or they will think that maybe you're selling a product that doesn't have really good quality. 
And if they see a series of these types of complaints early and you're already writing appeals to get ASINs reinstated or you're suspended early on, like you're starting off on a really bad foot to the point that you might get discouraged or Amazon might be discouraged about you or both. And then you're kind of starting this new business in a hole and you're digging out of a hole. And it's so much better to be ready for Amazon to educate yourself on what are they going to give me problems with? What will they hassle me about? Well, documentation, <laughs> uh, buyer experience. Do they think that the buyers will complain? Um, rights ownership. Do they think that you've really put the time in to protect your brand and understand what rights ownership is? Or you at least have an attorney that you can talk to about it. Um, authenticity. Amazon's afraid of being accused of selling counterfeit products. So if you're reselling or if anyone's going to complain about your item quality, it might come through as a counterfeit complaint. So you just have to anticipate these things as much as possible and have the documentation, but also anticipate how you need to appeal. I mean, you can always talk to somebody like me and my calendar is open to the public. Anyone can, can pay for a one hour consult and talk to me, but you might have to, you might save yourself that trouble if you think about, well, what kind of appeal will they need from me if this ASIN is suspended and it's for condition or if it's for quality, like have some of those ideas ready instead of like it happens out of nowhere and you're just scrambling to come up with some. That's yeah. right. uh, where our people can find you on your website uh, and also mm-hmm. on the Facebook. Yeah. So the, the Facebook group is Amazon seller first class and maybe you can include the link. I'll get to the link. Um, and also my website is ecommercechris.com. And if you want to email me direct, I have a contact form on my website. It's really easy to use, but if you want to email me directly, if that's easier, it's just Chris, C H R I S at ecommercechris.com. And that's usually the best place to start if you have a problem. And about confidence where people can uh, see you in, because they, we spoke that there is some, a lot of people who speak about, your subject, but without yep. experience like you. So it's important to... to right. Out. Oh, there's a lot of people who speak on the topics that I cover, but I'm the only one who worked on those actual teams, the seller performance teams. Um, and, and anyone who hires... In, maybe I should talk about this for a second. Anyone who hires an expert, ask them a lot of questions about strategy, about their background. Um, don't just look at a bunch of reviews online. They might not even be real. And price. Um, <laughs> I mean, and also consider things like, well, you know, some, some providers are like giving discounted services to people to recommend them. There's all sorts of stuff going on, but you have to understand what they do. Don't say, do you have a website? Already look at the website before you talk to that person and try to figure out what questions you have for them to determine if they are an expert for real or are they kind of pretending to be an expert. Um, The Prosper show in Las Vegas is coming up. So I don't know how many people in EU are planning to go all the way to Las Vegas one month from now. Uh, It's March uh, 24 and 25 March. But I do a workshop there about protecting yourself from black hat tactics. That's on the 23rd. And then on the 24th is the seller performance panel. So if you're in the United States already or you're planning to come to Las Vegas for another conference, I recommend that people go to the Prosper Show because they do vet people for experts for expertise before they let them speak. (laughs) It's not right. It's not like a show where you see all these pictures and you see all these names and they say highly recommended. I mean, like why, where did they come from? What is their expertise? The prosper show, you have the faith that they've already done their homework for some homework for you. And they're only putting people in front of you who are established experts. I see uh, a lot of sponsored. Uh, speakers from yeah. the PPC companies pretending that they mm-hmm. are PPC experts and they are showing the screenshots of the <laughs> <laughs> of the brands, you know, like taking a Coca Cola yeah. and think, pretending that they sell a lot. So it's really that's why I, it uh, depends. I, yeah, I, I'm, Some, really, uh, yeah. I'm really happy to have you because of these things. You know, is mm-hmm. on my channel I have few people who are really experts in the fields on about right. Amazon. There are Greg Mercer from the Jungle Scout. Yeah, and Jungle Scouts crowd. Yeah, Alien Ten, and I have mm-hmm. uh, Lira Hitchcock, who is amazing yep. on PC, and I have. Mm-hmm. So I'm really taking care who is bringing on my channel to protect my people. 
You're taking care of your audience. That's a good sign. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, some of this is common sense. It's not even Amazon consulting. It's a business consulting. But be aware of people's like affiliate commissions with other companies. I mean, that makes a difference if they're being paid to recommend somebody. Maybe, maybe the financial incentive is more than their logic in terms of should I recommend these people? And then when it comes to some conferences, people are paying a sponsorship fee in order to speak. So the only reason they're being presented as an expert is because they've paid a few thousand bucks to be a sponsor. I mean, in my, you know, perspective, I guess on this, because I've had conferences too. I do the seller velocity conference. Somebody shouldn't be paying in order to be represented as an expert. They should be an expert before you ever call them. And then when you call them, you should talk about how their expertise will help Amazon sellers at your conference instead of the other way around. Yeah, but so. I, I see some conference, they call speakers uh, from click funnels. You know, when you sell a lot of courses yeah. from click funnels, you yeah. get uh, approval that you are an expert in, in, <laughs> in marketing yeah. more than in uh, Amazon, but they call you to speak. Right. So it's, it's really dangerous. Right. People don't it depends on how you define people. the word expert. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so Chris, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. And we chat 50 minutes, almost one hour. Mm -hmm. It looks yeah. like a five minutes. We have a, <laughs> a material for five hours to speak. Yeah. But we I, do. We have a lot. We can, we can always talk again. I mean, um, I'd love to hear reaction from your audience and what questions they have. Okay. I'm sure I'll hear from a few of them. And then if they have ideas for another conversation, let's do it. Of course. I will let them know to contact you if they have any, any, questions to, to have mm -hmm. uh, to speak with you sure and if they're ever in boston i do a meetup in boston as well so we're happy to see them at the meetup too i will meet you when you come in europe when you have one conference i will come to, to i'm trying yeah i'm trying to get something together in switzerland in zurich in june i think or late may um but i'm in going may. to wait and see in yeah. may yeah I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see how things go um in terms of uh, coronavirus and everything before I make my final plans. So Yeah, of course. Okay, Chris, thank you for your time, man. We stay thank you. on the social media. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.